Thank you. So it's really good to be here tonight. And this is my, my third time with TEDx Tokyo, and each time it's been different. You know, I don't know how many years ago, but I had a friend who told me that the way we where we are right now is that things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster. And he said that 25 years ago. What about now? Patrick talks about 2030. And I kind of go, uh, not sure. I know that we need a sense of direction. And we need to take elegant minimum steps in that direction. There's no master plan for now. Part of that's because these are VUCA times. How many of you have heard of VUCA times? Okay. Volatile, chaotic, uncertain, and ambiguous. What I said was that we live in VUCA times. Volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous. How do we do that? And what role does disaster play? I arrived in early November this year, just after the typhoons and just as Northern California and Southern California were burning. This is a car on the freeway as many people were trying to escape to some place that was safer in Southern California. These disasters are framing our lives. And it's not just climate. Yeah, of course, wildfires, tornadoes, landslides, earthquakes, tsunamis. But there's much more. You know, we're also in a time of massive political dysfunction everywhere. You know, I don't know if I'd, if I'd trade Trump for Abe. I don't know that that would be a good trade. But boy, you look at what's going on in the United States right now. I think we're on the edge of governmental collapse. Maybe not. Maybe so. At the same time, we've got an increasing gap in wealth. At the same time, we've got... Oops. See, this is what happens with PowerPoints. Same time, we've got increasing social inequities. In Japan, we've both got an aging population and a declining population. And in the United States, we've got opioid addictions, mass shootings, immigration crisis, all of that's going on. But the deal is that those aren't problems to be fixed. They're actually hard truths to be confronted. And when we confront them, we have to discover what it is that we're each called to do. What's truly important? What's actually worth getting out of bed in the morning for? You know, I started in Japan as a student in 1970 at Waseda University. And my work was called into Japan in 2010, before the triple disasters. After the disasters, for, from 2011 to 2016, I spent between four and six months every year working in communities in Tohoku as well as across Japan in this question of how do we create a future that we actually want rather than government simply rebuilding the past. AG Press published my first book in 2015, Mirai ga Minaku Naru Toki Ni. I published the English edition of that in 2017. And they're both about this question of what do we do when we can't see the future? Yeah, there's that sense of direction, but actually, you know, the future... How many of you, if you, if you wind back to 2010, how many of you thought your lives would be what they are today, 2020, 10 years later? Anybody? Not so much. Okay. So it's a question of how do we actually begin doing what's truly important to us. Earlier this month, just after getting to Japan, uh, some friends and I every year organize a learning journey to Fukushima. Each year, the mood in the region is a little bit different, and it's the same across the region. 
This year, Sugeno-san, a rice farmer in Nihonmatsu, was the one who summed it up. He was exhausted. It's been eight years, eight months, for God's sake. What are you doing? How are you working this? And his response was, I had to change my mindset. I realized that I'm not here to fix problems. I'm actually here to do things that are important that bring me joy. And if they don't bring me joy, I'm stopping. And the only way I can do that is by being connected with friends and neighbors. I want to go back to 2011. There's one massive story of Onagawa. Maybe some of you know this. Onagawa is the village of 10,000 just north of Ishinomaki that was completely destroyed. There was no old normal to go back to. The mayor at the time said, we need new leadership. I can't figure out where to go. And so he went out and he recruited some, a hometown boy who was in the national diet, who was in his 30s. And he asked Sudasan if he would run for mayor. And Sudasan said, okay. And he was elected. First thing he did after he became mayor was he looked at the plans that the professionals had been developing. Something didn't look right. Something didn't feel right. He looked again, and it still didn't look right. So he went back to the old mayor and said, tell me, frankly, what do you think of these plans? The old mayor, you know, wanting to give space for the new guy, kind of paused. And finally he said, frankly, I have some misgivings. So Sudasan talked to some other people. Same response every time. Frankly, I have some misgivings. And so he went out, and he started talking to people in the community. He said, you know, I hate town hall meetings. All people do is shout at each other. They never listen. So he went out, and he met in the different temporary housing. He went, met in businesses. He met in cafes. He met anywhere he could find people to ask, what's important to you? What do you want Onagawa to be? And he managed to reframe total obliteration as a once-in-a-lifetime, as a once-in-a-thousand years is the way he said it, opportunity. They threw out the old plans, and within six months they had new plans. So plans are actually important, especially for something at this scale. What they decided they'd do is they'd come in and they'd level the mountaintops surrounding the harbor. That would be the new residential area. They'd take the dirt from those mountaintops and they'd bring it down and they'd create a level that was like four meters above sea level for schools and commercial and for libraries and hospitals. They'd leave industry and fisheries down at the sea level. And then they'd build a beautiful set of roads interconnecting everything. They did all of that because what came through as most important was safety and beauty. We want a community that's safe, and we want a community that's beautiful, and we're not going to settle for anything else. So the mountaintops are gone. The housing is being built on the top. This commercial street was open about was about opened in about 2016, I think. It's like unlike any shopping street I've seen any place else in Japan. And the reason that people have been able to tolerate eight years of living in temporary housing is because they had a shared dream. It was a shared dream that they created, a shared dream that they shared, a shared dream that they could step into. Doesn't happen always at that scale. I want to bring in a couple stories from a, a future session that I was doing in Akashi last Sunday. This is Sudasan and his wife and their daughter. A couple of years ago when she was born, they said, you know, our parents don't live here. We're not really connected to anyone. We don't want to raise our daughter that way. What do we do? And so they started talking to, to friends and neighbors and strangers. And together, they created Happy House, which, get this, is a six-story share house 
going from babies to people over 100. They've created community together. They eat together. They play together. They take care of each other together. And they have their private space as well. Or over in, that was in Kobe, in, in Akashi itself, there's an architect, Nishiguchi-san, who says, you know, the way our kids are learning, it stinks. All they're doing is going to school. You know, it's interesting what you said, Patrick, about the, the, the level of English in Japan at this point in time. That's another thing that's forced down on top of people in our schools. He said, it's not working. And our kids aren't going to be ready for the world that they're stepping into. And then he saw this picture. Maybe 100 years ago, 150. He said, look, all those kids are happy. They're smiling. They're working. I think they're learning. And they look like they're enjoying themselves. So he did the natural thing. He started talking to some people about an idea for what would it be like to create a cram school for life? Not for studies, but for life. And they got together and they did that. You know, you might look at those, and you might even look at Onagawa, and think about them in the context of the issues and the problems that we're facing right now, and say, it's nice, but so what? Does it actually change anything? Does it actually make anything better, except for people in that one small place? You know, and that question reminds me of, of what Margaret Mead said years ago. Remember her quote? She said, never doubt that a thoughtful group of committed, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that can. These actions from Onagawa to Akashi, across Japan and across the world, are where people are coming together, emphasizing what's important to them. And they're shifting their mindset. They're living into a different set of possibilities. And the core of those possibilities usually revolves around happiness. You know, I swear, I rarely heard people in Japan talk about happiness before March 11th. After March 11th, it was almost impossible to have any serious conversation where people weren't talking about happiness. When connected, these little isolated projects become like caterpillars transforming into butterflies. These imaginal cells are where we transform three critical things, mindset, skill set, and culture. I'm going to go to California. Uh, I didn't realize until the last week or so that, that I've been spending a lot of time where Patrick grew up in Northern California, working with people in the fire-affected counties. This is a picture from Paradise. Paradise is the town of 27,000 that was burned to the ground on November 8, 2018, so just a year ago. And people are discovering how they want to go forward, what it means. I, want to, I got a, an email this afternoon from a good friend in Paradise after a conversation we had, and I realized I wanted to read it tonight. I wanted to share as we're having the, that conversation on the interconnectedness at all levels. I was reminded that it goes both ways, the tear down and the build up. What we saw on November 8th, 2018 was collapse from multiple connected failures. The spark from PG&E power lines, the low humidity and high winds and drought conditions that were fueled by human-made climate change. Poor forest management from Cal Fire, whose primary funding, is so, funding source is timber extraction, which means that they've managed these lands for short-term profit, not for biodiversity and health. Add to that poor planning of homes and towns, a poor evacuation plan, all in a community that was impoverished and didn't have any insurance. All of those failures were interconnected. It wasn't one thing. It was a complex set of failures. Our success at regenerating paradise has to be interconnected as well. How do we do that? You know, we do it by talking to each other. One of the reasons I had to wear the hat tonight is because I do it all the time anyway, but my excuse 
is my friend Alan in the middle of that circle who sent me that email, has his hat on. We gather, we talk, we dream, we strategize, we talk about what's really important to us and where we're going to put our life energy. We do it with shovels, we do it with hands, we do it together. We begin to see what's important, what are we going to do, and how are we going to connect it. And what we're saying is that all of this is coming together as Regenerating Paradise. And we've just launched the new Regenerating Paradise website as a beginning point. Regenerating Paradise really has five stages to it. Oh, I can't go there first. Before I go there, all of this, this regenerating community, what it's really all about is heartfulness. It's about stepping towards what's important with our heart and with our whole body. And Stephen's going to be talking about that next, so I'm not going to say too much because I think he's going to say it better. But actually, this work of regenerating communities, it's about heartfulness. And, you know, it starts off with people getting together and talking with each other about what's actually important. What do you want to do? What do I want to do? You want to do that? It sounds like it's connected to what I want to do. Let's talk. Let's have a deeper conversation. Let's see what we can do to discover a starting point. And then let's go out and try something. You know, likely, whatever we try is not going to work. But we're going to take action. We're going to see what happens. We're going to reflect on what happens. Then we're going to try something else. And gradually, we're going to find success. Part of what we're going to do is we're going to keep talking to each other. We're not going to get isolated in these little silos where we're only looking at what we're doing and not being aware of what's going on in the community as a whole. We're going to stay connected so that rather than what happened in Japan and happens all over the world after disasters, what happens is people rush in, they've got good energy, they've got something they want to do. Generally, those become silos. They become adversaries rather than allies. Money goes away, energy goes away, and they all fall down. People in paradise are saying, let's not have, par- let's not have silos, let's have imaginal cells. The next part is communicating that with the community as a whole. So these things that are going on aren't going on secretly in an isolation where people are kind of going, I don't know what the hell they're up to, must not be any good. No, let's use what we're doing and the results that we're getting to inform and inspire and invite others to engage as well. As we do that, our work starts to become a lighthouse, starts to go out further and further beyond paradise, beyond Northern California. And we're interconnected with other communities that are finding their way forward for similar challenges as well. In some ways, it's simple. Do what's truly important to you. Do it together. Don't stand alone. Listen to each other as if your lives depend on it, because they do. Never stop asking questions. You don't need a big plan. You just need a sense of direction and a first step. Keep listening. Reflect on what happens. Change course. Get better results. It's hard sometimes. Keep going. If it stops bringing joy, stop. Those are the lessons for regenerating community. That's where it begins. And for me and for my MPO, it's all about changing our story so we change what's possible. And that's it. Who has a question?